Good morning and welcome to Open Hearts Unite series free from BDSM. My name is Krista Garcia. I am a self-love coach, transformational speaker, and dream facilitator. So for those of you who don't know, who haven't been following me for a long time, I educate people on the reality that BDSM is abuse. Now, recently I did a Facebook Live with my friend, Tanya Diamond, and I'm gonna put a link in the low bar so you can go directly to the Facebook page. It's public, so you'll be able to see the live. You can also follow me on Facebook. I have a Facebook business page and I have a Facebook personal page. And if you follow, you can follow both, but on also the personal page, you'll be able to see, if you follow me there, you'll be able to catch those Facebook lives. So Tanya was asking me many questions about what I do and the conversation I am about free from BDSM and educating people in the reality that BDSM is abuse. So Tanya had great questions to ask. And so recently she posted these comparisons that people are using to say that BDSM is not abuse. So today I'm going to go over these points. There's two photos I'm going to be showing that have these points on there. And I'm going to show you how, yes, BDSM is actually abuse. And the BDSM rhetoric actually muddies those waters and continues to push that BDSM is not abuse. So let's take a look at these. So first, I want to start with the most basic one. So I can't give credit to whoever created these. These are just something that was placed up. So this is how some people are using to distinguish. Now, this is titled The Difference Between BDSM and Abuse. Now, the main difference that BDSM puts here is communication. And abuse, underneath it just says abuse. Now, for those who don't know what abuse is, now, I think we do, but let's just go over the um, This really is not a complicated thing. We know what abuse is, but BDSM muddies the word water so much and has left so much confusion where there really shouldn't be any. So the problem is that BDSM has left people questioning if being harmed is being abuse. That is extremely problematic. And this is exactly what's keeping BDSM victims and BDSM survivors from being acknowledged heard and getting support that they need. So that is the reason I'm doing all of this. I, I wanna create the awareness of BDSM victims and survivors. There are so many who are in abject terror of speaking up because the BDSM community is doing, having conversations such as this, these gaslighting conversations that leave victims and survivors feeling as if maybe they were wrong, maybe they didn't get harmed. Now, this is exactly the reason why BDSM victims and survivors are in abject terror of speaking up, because anytime they try to, they're instantly gaslighted and shut down by BDSM rhetoric. And the BDSM community lashes out at them and tells them that they just don't know what they're talking about. This is very dangerous, and this is why so many have stayed silent for so long. And that's why so many come to me privately, because they're absolutely terrified. They see the communication of how things are happening. They see how I get talked to, and they definitely don't want to experience that themselves. So they stay hidden because they are terrified. Okay, so let's go into this. Now, this is this person says the difference between BDSM and abuse. Now, the number one thing that they say is BDSM has communication and abuse is abuse. Well, the fact that people are questioning if being harmed is abusive, BDSM tries to complicate things, tries to say, oh, there's a gray area. Now, I'm speaking specifically on the conversation of BDSM itself. A lot of people like to bring up a bunch of other topics, and that's a way of bypassing and cloaking and not staying on topic and talking about BDSM. So bringing up other topics does not work because right now we are having the conversation of BDSM. And the reason I say and pointedly say to stay on topic in these conversations is people try and bring in other things. They try and bring in inanimate, inanimate objects. They try and conflate BDSM with an inanimate object and they try to conflate it with sports. If you wanna talk about violence in sports, it's a valid conversation, but bring it to sports. We are talking about sexuality here. BDSM is within the realm of sexuality. Whether it actually leads to sex or not, we are talking about sexuality here. 
And so, no, there is no violence in sexuality. We are very clear that if there's something violent within sexuality, it is sexualized violence. It is harmful. It is dangerous. We do not bring violence into sex because that is sexualized violence. It is something we are speaking up to globally to end sexual exploitation and end sexual violence. So to create conversations of pretense that is anything like, that BDSM is anything like an inanimate object such as a gun, you cannot conflate BDSM with an inanimate object because you're not working with an inanimate object, you are working with human beings. And we are talking about sexuality here. Human beings are human beings, they are not objects to be done onto. So no, violence does not belong in sexuality. We are pretty clear in every conversation on this, but BDSM tries to create this rhetoric and pretense. There's one place where sexualized violence is okay. No, it's not. When you bring violence into sexuality, that is sexualized violence. And it is something that human rights advocates such as myself and many other people are speaking up to in the rest of the world in creating a safe place for people to get away from sexual violence while BDSM lures people into sexual violence and creates these gaslighting rhetorics pretending that sexual violence is okay and that it can be consensual when it cannot be. We are very clear that sexual violence is sexual violence. So again, bringing up other topics has no place when we're having a conversation about sexuality. It is not the same as anything else that is being brought up and it is not an inanimate object. We are very clear that sexualized violence cannot be consented to. That's very clear across the board. However, BDSM pretends that it can and it creates much confusion and it hides abuse and it hides the reality that BDSM is abuse with tons of gaslighting rhetoric pretending and obscuring the reality that BDSM is sexualized violence. So when the BDSM rhetoric pretends that there is a place for sexualized violence, it automatically and intensively and viciously silences the survivors of the abuse that is BDSM. And the, the cloaking techniques are a way of dismissing and, and trying to take away the focus of BDSM itself. So what is abuse? You can Google it. Look it up, abuses, whether it is a misuse of something, whether it's verbal. So there's many different aspects of abuse, which is physical, verbal, you know, sexual, psychological. Again, it's it's not it's not a complicated definition. We know we're taught very young, we don't hit others, we don't harm others. It's it's the, this is the absolute basics of a conversation. So the fact that EDSM continues to pretend something is complicated where it's not is in fact the issue with BDSM, the BDSM rhetoric, because it's all about cloaking the reality that BDSM is abuse. And most people really don't believe that BDSM is abuse when they're in it. I know I didn't. I was a professional dominatrix for 10 years. I was also a submissive and a switch. A switch is someone who identifies as both submissive and switch for many years. And so I really believe that what I was doing was good. I really believe that what I was engaging with was sexual empowerment. And this is the problem of the BDSM rhetoric because it cloaks so well, but not well enough. Again, I've been doing this, you know, I've been exploring this for over 13 years and I have been beyond those years working to dismantle all of the rhetoric. It's not easy because it took me years to detox from it first so I can have clarity to actually see things clearly and to actually get down to the bottom of it. So let's go. So communication. Communication does not negate abuse. What BDSM does is I am about to abuse you. That does not negate the fact that something is in fact abuse. Me telling someone I'm gonna slap you in the face and, and then afterwards say, well, I told you I was gonna slap you in the face, so that slap doesn't count, does not negate abusive behavior. The onus is on the person who is in fact instilling the abuse. So there are a lot of many ways to be abused and to abuse in BDSM. Now, the next screen over, if you look at abuse, so BDSM only has six things here, right? So we're going to go over to guilt and excuses, right? And, and on the other side, you will see agreement. So guilt and excuses, not having guilt 
about harming someone, that does not equate to not harming someone. Okay. A lot, again, there are many people in BDSM who really believe they're doing something good. So they would not have guilt because they actually believe they're doing something good. Now, there are the other people who are in BDSM because they know they can get away with actually harming people. They don't feel guilt because they're just very clear. They want to go out and harm. Both people are harming. Neither one feels guilt for two different reasons. Now, excuses. <laughs> The agreement over here, that is actually an excuse. And this whole, this, whole, uh, this whole diagram over here of BDSM is an excuse. It is the excuse to abuse. There are so many different gaslighting rhetoric points that are used to say, well, it's safe, sane, and consensual, which there is nothing safe nor sane nor consensual about BDSM, which is what I'm talking about here. So they're trying to you know, whoever this, this rhetoric in BDSM tries to cover over the fact that you cannot consent to abuse. Now, what do I mean by that? Because there are people who are like, yeah, I can. If I want to be abused, I can ask someone to abuse me. I'm an individual. I have all the rights to do whatever I feel like. Okay. As an individual, that person can ask to be harmed. Sure. Whether it's healthy or not, it's not healthy. Now, as an individual, the individual can ask to be abused. That doesn't make it healthy, but sure, they have the individual right to do whatever they want. This is where the onus goes on the dom, the person who's inflicting the harm. The onus goes on to the dom. So if a person comes up to me and says, I'm gonna be punched in the face, person has every right to say whatever they feel like coming out of their mouth, fine. But the second I punch them in the face, the onus is on me. Why? because it doesn't matter if someone is begging for it, I am the one responsible to not do it. Someone who's chopping from the bottom is often usually telling their partner, well, this is what I want. And if you don't support it, you're not kink friendly, uh, AKA abuse enabling. Um, and therefore you don't really care about me. You don't care about our sexuality and we're not gonna have sex until you do X, Y, and Z to me. Now, what people need to recognize is the, the abuse is happening on both ends here. The person who is like coercing the other person, like you need to do this, that's abusive. That's psychologically abusive. The other person who doesn't know what to do and who's terrified and who's like, um, okay, I guess I'll harm you, is being coerced into harming the other person. Uh, the person who is being coerced needs to just get out of there. If someone begs you to slap them in the face, do not do it. It's extremely unhealthy. Step away from the gaslighting. If someone is telling you, you either hurt me or this relationship is over, get out. Get out. It's a very dangerous position because the second we put our hands on someone else, the we have that responsibility. Even like, so being coerced into harming someone is a very dangerous place to be. You're, the second we put our hands on someone else, even if we're being coerced to do so, we are both being abused and the abuser at the same time. So, so back to the agreement, right? So again, someone can come up to me and say, I want to be punched in the face, but when I punch them in the face, the onus is on me. They are not having an agreement, okay? They can be begging for it. Uh, please, you need to do this for me. It'll make me so happy. That is not a healthy place to be. If someone's asking for that, they are not in a healthy mind frame. So if I hurt that person and they say they told me to, it was consensual, they really wanted it, that goes completely off the window. If someone's asking for someone that if someone's even begging for it, that does not that does not mean that I have the right and the entitlement to say, to take the responsibility off of myself and say they asked for it. Now, so this, this is a, a key thing. Like when the individual says, well, I have a right. I have a right to ask for what I want. Okay, but then those who are harming others, do we have a right to harm another person? No, we do not have a right to harm anybody. So there is no right to harm. We don't have an entitlement to harm. And so the sneaky part of that is dismissing our own self-responsibility of harming another person by saying they asked for it. We don't get to say that. 
So mooning into honeymoon uh, and planning. So we're gonna do those two together because over here you see scene play and aftercare. So honeymoon planning setup, right? So scene play, aftercare, debrief, right? So we're gonna go into that. The honeymoon scenario is all about the scene play, the aftercare, every, you know, oh, it's so exciting, we're having a session, we're scene playing. The scene play is actually just, it's abuse. The planning is, it's all planned, it's all calculated, the whole thing is laid out. The agreement, oh, we're gonna talk about it beforehand, then we're gonna lay it out. The planning, putting the scene together, scene together. The aftercare, now let's talk about aftercare. There's no such thing as aftercare. What that is, it's grooming. So that rhetoric pr pr um, creates this, preconceived notion that what you're getting is nurturing. So a lot of people will do anything just to be held, just to be feel some kind of love. A lot of people who are out there having sex, you know, Warren Farrell, he he did a talk in the national, you know, the, the now, um, the National Organization for Women, where he asked men, how many of you have had sex when you really just wanted a hug? Almost every single man raised his hand. And there's a lot of people out there who would do anything who are so starving. Most people are so starving for care and love and nurturing that they would do so much damage to themselves and not understand that the aftercare of BDSM is not the love, care, and nurturing that they're seeking. It's actually grooming. So grooming in the context of BDSM, well, grooming is creating a space, creating a false sense of trust to lure someone into a space of abuse. Now in the context of what that looks like acting out in BDSM, it's luring someone in with, I'm gonna give you that high, I'm gonna give you that sexual high that you're seeking, I'm gonna give you that false sense of power, that power that turns into a feeling of a power trip instead of like the innate power that most people are actually seeking. So I am going to feed your highs. I'm going to trigger that trauma sense of ecstasy, which is really just a trauma response so that I can feed my own sadistic hunger so that I can get away with abuse by desensitizing you by the grooming of creating the illusion of trust by feeding your high. So another part of that that BDSM instills is also the alienation. The languaging of BDSM is all about alienating. The vanilla, the term vanilla, every way to separate one from the rest of the, the community and society of this is something that is, you're doing something different. And it also creates, you know, by having people engage and consent uh, or gaslighting people to believe they're consenting to their own abuse, it leaves the BDSM abuse victims feeling completely alienated because they're terrified of coming forward with what was done to them. And so it's because they are, you know, they're just afraid of everything that they, that transpired and they're in shock about it. So that's another element of the grooming that creates a sense of alienation with BDSM between the languaging and also all of the elements of BDSM itself. So it's grooming that person to be used to the abuse, to take on the abuse for the reward of being nurtured, but there is no nurturing there. Nurturing does not require a price. Nurturing does not, there's no abuse in nurturing. There is no payment for nurturing. Nurturing comes from a space of actually care and loving someone and, and being supportive of someone and being gentle with someone. A lot of people confuse the gentleness after, which is called the aftercare of BDSM. That's one term for it there. Um, so, they think that, oh, well, I'm being held gently now. This must be what nurturing is. No, that's what grooming is. So that's all part of the honeymoon. The honeymoon is part of the aftercare, the planning, the setup. That's all part of the agreement, seed plane, aftercare, and debrief. So the debrief is checking in. How did it go? What did you like? What didn't you like? X, uh, X Y, and Z. So a lot of people think, oh, well, that's great. That's all part of the communication that they started off with. 
No, what that is, it's just regulating the abuse to be the type of abuse that you're used to and that you're comfortable with. So people who have experienced trauma and even people who haven't experienced extensive trauma, most people have experienced trauma of some sort, whether it be physical, psychological, sexual, or broken bones, et cetera. Or even if people have, even if there's a rare human being who's never experienced trauma, because that's not the only way to get caught into abuse, people also think because of the BDSM rhetoric, they're entering something that's safe, sane, and consensual, and they're just getting to play. They're just getting to explore. But the reality is they're being lured and coerced into abuse. So the debrief creates another pretend, pretending that this was not just abuse. I just harmed you. Now I'm asking you, was that okay? It's another way of, of saying, oh, okay, so this worked, this worked, this didn't work, whatever. It's another way of creating the pretense that there is consent there when there is not. Now, the planning, the setup, it's all about starting the cycle over again. And then BDSM just continues to perpetuate the cycle over and over again as well. So now a lot of people think that intention makes the fact that someone harmed another person okay. It doesn't. It's not about, you know, uh, people who are just maliciously out there because not everybody in BDSM has this malicious intent, even though the outcome is the same. So intent is not enough when we're talking here. A lot of people talk about, well, there are people who are in there, they're maliciously doing things, but um, there are other people who are like, but I know I'm in integrity. I'm doing great things. I, I love my partner. I'm doing all the stuff and, and I know I'm in, in you know, I'm in, I'm in a space of love and all the stuff. A person may think, well, uh, I understand that. I understand when people say that because I was there. I understand that space because I was in that space. I understand that absolute blindness to what I was doing. And I had to be blind to what I was doing because there was no way that I would consciously engage in abuse. That was not what I wanted to do. I did not want to harm people, even though I was harming people. And that's the problem with BDSM. It leaves this rhetoric in place and it creates excuses for people to continue to harm others and stay in this la-la land fantasy that they're not. Oh, well, my intentions are good. It doesn't matter. People have done plenty of horrible things in the name of good intentions. Good intentions does not dismiss abuse, okay? So whether people are in BDSM for malicious reasons or do believe they're in good intentions, the, the intent goes out, the intent is not enough. It's the impact and both have the same impact. Okay, so here is the other image. And so we're gonna go across, you know, go back and forth. What is BDSM? The use of bodily sensations to elicit pleasure. What is abuse? A way to cause physical, mental, and or emotional damage or harm to another person. Now, BDSM is not the use of bodily sensations to elicit pleasure. Okay, that is the gaslighting tactic that is used. You can touch the body in many ways, and just because the body is becoming aroused does not mean that it is pleasurable or consensual. There are people who are raped who have an orgasm, not because they liked it and not because it was consensual, okay? So it's actually, BDSM is the misuse of bodily sensations to create confusion and pretend that it is not abuse. When in fact, BDSM does use physical, mental, and does cause physical, mental, and emotional damage and sexual damage to a, another person. Next line. What is BDSM? A form of consensual power exchange where both participants are empowered. What is abuse? It takes away another's power. Both people, the BDSM is not about power, okay? It is about power over, there is a difference. When we talk about power, innate power, we have innate power that's called sovereignty. We are innately powerful. The power that BDSM is talking about is power over someone. When you talk about power exchange, it's about power over somebody. Somebody is giving power over to another person and that is in fact, taking another person's power away. And in very extreme ways, the person is completely, is in a space of submission physically, emotionally, and psychologically. Now, again, people try to say, well, it was consensual. Both participants are empowered. No, the empowerment of someone does not, you, to dominate someone is not to empower another person. To submit to someone is not empowering another person or 
or oneself. This is not a, an experience of empowerment. This is an experience of subjugation, domination, and abuse. So we're going to go over to what is the BDSM column. Before anything happens, each participant must negotiate and come to an agreement. What is abuse? Nobody knows when or how it will happen and nobody ever Okay, there's a typo. Nobody ever negotiates or agrees to it happening. Again, this is where, you know, so this is where BDSM really gets into that gaslighting rhetoric. I, well, if I let you know ahead of time, then it's not abuse. That is not logical. Okay. If I smack, I tell someone I'm going to smack you ahead of time. That does not negate the smack. It is still very much a smack. Okay. Now, just because you knew it was coming does not negate that I smacked you in the face. I still hurt you. Okay. Now, everything has to negotiate. We have to come to an agreement. Again, this is a way that BDSM twists things and takes the onus off of the person creating the harm and coercing. Okay. So the reality is, doesn't matter if we negotiate, if we negotiate your abuse, I am still abusing you. Okay. Someone is asking me to be abused. That is not healthy. And if I am taking advantage of that, even if I'm not like conscious of it, because there are people like, oh, well, I'm doing the right thing. No, it's not right to take advantage of another person's unhealthy demand, or even it may be placed as a request for one's own sadistic pleasure. Okay, that's not healthy. Next one. What is BDSM? Creates excitement to see your partner. What is abuse? Causes most people to fear and be afraid of their partner. So here's a lot of assumption. A lot of people think that their partner may not be afraid. Numbing out to fear does not mean that a person is not afraid. A person is just also can be just numbing out into fear. Many people say yes when they, they are terrified. So that does not create excitement. Also creating a trauma adrenaline high is not the same as can be often confused as excitement. And if people are, are being coerced and their trauma is being used against them, that can create a fear and that can create an adrenaline rush that can be confused with excitement, okay? So if someone seems excited, chances are they're having an adrenaline rush because their body is anticipating the abuse that is coming. Next, next line, what is, abuse? What is BDSM? Creates, relies upon, and builds trust. What is abuse? Destroys any and all forms of trust. Actually, this is, and there's another massive um, gaslighting tactic that is used in the BDSM rhetoric. Creates, relies upon, and builds trust. No, creates and relies upon the traumatic perception of what is okay. Now, a traumatic perception cannot fully understand what is healthy and what is not. So it's not building trust. It is building the it is building upon the regularity of abuse, the regularity of past trauma, or it's creating and or it is also creating the gaslighting uh, rhetoric that is saying this is trust. Look at us. This is what trust looks like. You tell someone. You know, this is what, you know, and this is very dangerous. This is an extremely dangerous element of BDSM. The whole thing is dangerous, but this is really dangerous. It tells people that being abused is creating a foundation for trust. No, it is not. Okay. A sadist telling you this is trust. You letting me harm you is creating a foundation of trust. It's not. It's creating a foundation of feeding uh, is a feeding dysfunction. It's feeding dysfunction that is being put into a little label and it's being called trust. It's not. What it's, what it's building is a foundation of gaslighting. It's, it's, it's part of the grooming, okay? It's not building trust, it's reinforcing grooming, okay? What is abuse? destroys any and all forms of trust. That is in fact what BDSM does because BDSM warps the reality that, and, and teaches people that being abused is creating trust, it's not. So then people are detoxing from BDSM, they have a hard time recognizing what it is to trust another person because the last person they trusted was someone who actually really harmed them and taught them that this is what trust looks like. So that is absolutely abusive, okay? Um, creates excitement to see your partner. So 
uh, it's not creating excitement. It's actually reinforcing the trauma bond. It's reinforcing the trauma bond and creating an adrenaline rush because the body is anticipating the next level of abuse. That is fear. And in where it says what is abuse causes most people to fear and be afraid of their partner. Unfortunately, a lot of people think that that is actually excitement and it becomes twisted into excitement through BDSM, through the facade of excitement, through BDSM and the gaslighting. Oh, you're excited to see me. No, that's actually the body is having a fear response. Uh, okay, so what is abuse? Nobody knows when or how it will happen and nobody ever negotiates or agrees to it happening. So here's the thing. Gaslighting creates the illusion that this is not abuse. So a person still doesn't know that this is happening. And, and, and they are being taught that they are negotiating for it or agreeing to it, negotiated to it, you agree to it, but here's how it becomes so warped, okay? This is the misuse of it, right? Again, if, so, if I am gaslighting someone to be like, oh yeah, this is sexy. Don't you agree? This is hot. This is going to be really good. This, this, that's called coercion. That's not an agreement. That is coercion. Okay. So we're talking about a form of consensual power exchange where both participants are empowered, takes away another's power. Like I said, that someone's power is absolutely being taken away. Okay. Here we go. Do, 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 do. What is BDSM? Opens communication and supports an environment where both parties can talk freely about their thoughts and emotions. What is an abuse? No communication and no support. Okay, let's go into this. Okay, opens, what is BDSM? Opens a communication towards gaslighting tactics and supports an environment where both parties can talk freely about their thoughts and emotions within the context of gaslighting. That is not in fact a, a type of, that is not in fact open communication. That's actually the enrollment and the re-enrollment in gaslighting. And there's no support to see through it, okay? And when people speak up to the, BD, the abuse that is BDSM, there is ab, an absolute assault on those who do. Like I said, BDSM victims and survivors, they come to me mostly in private because they're in abject terror of the BDSM community because when they did speak up, they were gaslighted so hard and shamed, okay? So there is no communication and no support for BDSM victims and survivors. What is BDSM? Must never be performed when either partner is emotionally unstable, angry, and or, and or upset. What is abuse? Conducted when the abuser is emotionally unstable, angry, and or upset. Okay. There is nothing stable about harming another person. Therefore, the illusion that someone is emotionally stable and is not angry or upset is in fact another part of the illusion. Because someone is in a sadistic high, that does not make them emotionally stable, not angry or upset. A sadistic high. Now, if people don't know what a sadist is, a sadist is someone who gets off on harming another person. So you might see someone who looks completely joyful and completely seemingly at peace. They are not. They are riding a sadistic high, which to the untrained eye and to people who are not aware of this communication or who are not and to people who are not aware of this communication that I'm bringing forward that BDSM is abuse to the to the outsider looking in. It can look at as if that person is at peace. I will reiterate. A sadist is not at peace. They are not emotionally stable. They are angry and upset. That is all part of what drives the sadist. They are getting off on harming another person. So when you see that person at peace or seemingly looking as if they're talking so great and with a smile on their face, they are riding a sadistic high that is not healthy. Okay, that is extremely unstable. Yes, there's anger in that. And yes, there's upset in that. But you're not, you don't see the anger and upset because the high has already kicked in. Okay, what is BDSM? What is abuse? What is BDSM? Has rules, limits, and boundaries that must be respected at all times. There are even safety measures in place to make sure no, none are crossed. What is abuse? Abuse breaks the law. There are no rules, limits, or boundaries. It shows no respect toward the victim. Let's dive into this, shall we? Here's, uh, here's how BDSM deeply leaves BDSM victims and survivors as if there's something wrong with them because it can't possibly be BDSM and it leaves BDSM victims and survivors feeling like they're crazy, AKA that's part of the gaslighting because that's not BDSM. BDSM has rules and limits and boundaries. No, 
let's talk about this. Now, as a dominatrix of 13 years, a previous dominatrix of 13 years, I had people who would come to me and say, wow, I loved our session. And that was so amazing. And this other person, they just, they just wailed at me and blah, 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 whatever. Okay. So I was so in it. I was so stuck in it that I was like, wow, I can't believe those abusers. Right. I was like, those people, they're not following. They, in my mind, they weren't following the rules, limits, and boundaries that should be respected and the safety measures, the safe words and all of that jazz. So I saw myself as completely separate from that person who just completely did and, you know, and the sub was like, oh my God, sub I say, was like, oh, that was so wonderful. I wasn't, here's the difference. I'll tell you the only difference between me and the person that just wailed on this person, okay? We both abused him, okay? The difference was I gave him the abuse he was used to. So these limits, rules, and boundaries are just perpetuating this, this a familiar abuse. It doesn't mean it's less abusive. It's all abuse. It's just giving someone the abuse in the way that they're used to. Okay, that's not having rules or limits or boundaries. That's just should giving people the people the abuse they are used to, and that perpetuates the abusive cycle and keeps that person in a space of harm. So all I'm doing is I'm keeping that person and keeping that person hooked on their own trauma. Okay. So, so violence onto another person, we know we're not supposed to harm someone. We, we were taught this since we were very, very little, right? Okay. So no, when it comes to the, what BDSM calls again, rules, limits, or boundaries, that's not rules, limits, or boundaries. And it's just feeding abuse in a way that someone's traumatically comfortable with. That is very dysfunctional. It's extremely abusive, okay? And it's extensively abusive because it leaves that person feeling that what they're experiencing is not abuse. So it leaves them in the gaslighting tactic that they're not being abused. Actually, look how good I am. Look how good I'm being to you. This is the abuse you asked for. So it's okay. It's safe, sane, and consensual. It's not, okay? It's abusive. And then I'm telling the person they're not being abused. And I'm telling them, yes, this is empowering. Okay. No, there's no respect towards harming another person. And this is where BDSM creates this lie of confusion. I'm harming you because I respect you. Absolutely not. Harming another person is not respect. I'm going to say that again. Harming another person is not respect. Again, for someone who doesn't know anything about BDSM and who has these healthy conversations already, that's like obvious. It's very obvious to that person that you don't hurt people because that's disrespectful and it's abusive, okay? So no, there is no respect towards the victims of BDSM. And the second a victim of BDSM stands up, they will be bashed so completely and so entirely, and they are by the BDSM community, and I use that term lightly, and they are completely gaslighted and uh, oh my goodness, the, de the degradation and the violence aimed at BDSM abuse victims and survivors is why so many are terrified and keep their mouths shut. Now, if that sounds like that's respect towards a victim, then you lost me because that's not respect towards a victim at all. So that's in response to all of these things and what BDSM brings forward. So again, if someone is trying to coerce you into BDSM, get away. OK, because BDSM is abuse. It is a cycle of abuse. And if you get lured into abusing someone, you need to get away because that's very dangerous for both of you. OK, abusing someone is horrifying. If you are abused into being abusive, that's horrifying as well. And it's very clear if someone harms another person, the onus is on the person who creates the harm again. Now, it's very difficult because a lot of people are gaslighted into this. And I, it's BDSM has so warped the conversations of consent and has so uh, confused people, is creating, is promoting sexual violence and is confusing people and luring people into sexual violence and telling them that it's okay. Meanwhile, we're having all of these human rights conversations and supporting people across the gender line, getting away from violence, getting away from sexualized violence finding their voice in sexualized violence. And then we have BDSM rhetoric that pops in and says, well, if it turns you on, it's sexy. It's not, it's actually still abuse. 
okay? If a sadist is someone who gets off on harming someone, that is the definition of sadism, and that is right there in BDSM. Someone who gets off on harming someone. It's all in the definition of BDSM, right there, those four words. It's, it says it all there. A masochist is someone who gets off on being harmed, okay? Harm is already in the definition of BDSM. Harm is already there. It's in both of those. And it's also in bondage and domination. Binding someone, the need to restrict someone, the need to bind someone and dominate them, that's part of the dominance and submission, that is part of psychological harm, okay? That is also becomes physical harm. And it also can be a part of the sexual harm as well. I'll be making more videos. If you have any questions, leave them below. So you'll be seeing so many more videos of these. That's why I created the series free from BDSM here on my YouTube channel so that I can continue this education process and leave and create the awareness in the world that is lacking, that BDSM victims and survivors need support. Their voices matter. I stand by the Me Too survivors of BDSM, and that's across the gender line. And BDSM survivors need to be supported in being able to feel safe in coming forward because the conversation is constantly about uh, a lot of doms who are saying, oh, I love this, or the people in BDSM who are saying how much they love it. But it's all that, and this is why that red, this all of this BDSM rhetoric is very dangerous because what it does, it's not innocent. It actually, although a lot of people still think it is, and I understand that because BDSM creates the gaslighting rhetoric to leave people thinking that there's no harm being done, even though the very name of it talks about harm. That's how deep the gaslighting tactics are. So, however, I want people to become aware this rhetoric is not innocent. It is shutting down the voices of BDSM victims and survivors. BDSM rhetoric actually reinforces abuse in people's relationships. Domestic violence is not sexy, but BDSM tries to pretend that it is, okay? Harming people is not okay. It is abusive. We know this. this is the very basics of humanity. We know harming people is not healthy. We know it's unhealthy, okay? I'm not pointing out anything that's new. There are many people who understand that BDSM is abuse. I just have the capacity to unravel it in ways that most do not because I spent 13 years of my life in this realm, okay, to the point where I was creating a school on it. I was going to be teaching and training DOM submissives and switches. That's where my skill level was. Um, I went into that wanting to prove to people that BDSM is fantastic. I really wanted to prove that that was true. I found the reality that there was no line between BDSM and abuse. And at that time, that was very confronting for me because that's not what I was looking for. That's not what I wanted to find, but I found it and it completely changed my life. And it completely made me become completely self-responsible of who I was being. And that was not pretty. It was very ugly. So I understand why a lot of people are avoiding that awareness because it's not easy. It is a difficult awareness to come to. It is a brutal awareness to come to. When I had to come to the awareness that I was abusing people, oh my goodness, it flipped me upside down. My whole world was just completely deconstructed. However, that deconstruction led me to my health. So it was a powerful, powerful journey. So I will continue to educate people on the reality that it is abuse because there's a lot of people still in the BDSM community who spout this dangerous, deadly rhetoric, who don't recognize what they're doing is actually very dangerous and downright deadly. And it's keeping and it's silencing the BDSM victims and survivors and keeping them terrified from coming forward and speaking about their Me Too story. So again, I'm going to put the link below. Tanya and I, we had like a two hour discussion on this. So it's, it's a pretty raw discussion. If you want to see that live, you know, that, that Facebook live, I'm going to put the link below. I am going to be editing it. And so we'll be having those broken up too. But if you want to, you know, if you don't want to wait and you want to watch the two hours now, you can, and I'll put the, the link below. Thank you so much for watching another episode of Free from BDSM. If you are a BDSM victim and survivor, your voice matters, your abuse is real, and you matter. Thank you for being here. We rise, we rise together. No more sitting on the sidelines. 
not an option anymore I am the change I'm the change I've been waiting for